number one choice for Air Guard news. This is First Air Force Now. Hello and welcome again to another edition of First Air Force Now. I'm Master Sergeant Jerry Harlan. The 120th Fighter Wing ramp sat empty as three F-15 Eagles flew in tight formation over the Montana Air National Guard base. This was the final mission unit pilots would fly as members of a fighter wing. Senior Master Sergeant Eric Peterson reports. Early in the morning, unit members conducted the final sweep of the ramp to remove rocks and any other material that could potentially cause foreign object damage to the F-15 engines. The aircraft were then carefully prepared for flight by maintenance crews, ensuring that the aircraft would be delivered to the 144th Fighter Wing in top shape. 120th Fighter Wing pilots carried their flight equipment out to the ramp, escorted by family members to witness their last unit mission flown in an F-15 airframe. Unit personnel and retirees also gathered on base to watch as the last three fighter aircraft taxied to the end of the runway for the final flight preparation and takeoff. One by one, each fighter jet went from a virtual standstill at the end of the runway to fast attaining the fighter jet's needed takeoff speed. The audience appreciated hearing the loud, familiar roar of the F-15 engines as each aircraft quickly lifted up from the pavement and gained altitude. Once all aircraft were airborne, the three fighters assembled into a basic V formation and flew one last ceremonial flight over the 120th Fighter Wings airfield. The unit's personnel are now focused on training for their new C-130 Hercules air transport mission. In Great Falls, Montana, this is Senior Master Sergeant Eric Peterson reporting for First Air Force Now. 379th Air Expeditionary Wing Security Forces are on a mission to expand their awareness, share their knowledge, and build strong, lasting relationships with their host nation. Staff Sergeant Dustin Roberts reports. Members of the 379th Air Expeditionary Wing Security Forces spend a lot of time practicing their skills, ensuring the base is safe from threats. A recent training exercise paired them with host nation counterparts to exchange asset protection tactics such as building clearance, handcuff and search techniques, and the use of a K-9 unit. A lot of the stuff was similar, so we allowed them to kind of show us what, the, what they're used to doing. And like I said, we just gave them some extra tools of how our procedures go and how we operate, so it gives them those tools for how they can operate in the future. Although preparedness is an important part of this exercise, it's not the main focus. Building lasting relationships with our hosts is the number one priority. So it's all about partnerships. This training today just highlights that. Uh, from a security forces standpoint, as we defend the base, defend the Air Force assets, we are very much aware that we're on a host nation base. We want to tie in as many joint operations as possible with our host nation counterparts. Over the three-day exercise, a bond developed between these security professionals and it's their hope to make it a monthly training, living up to one team, one fight. Reporting from Southwest Asia, I'm Air Force Staff Sergeant Dustin Roberts. McConnell Air Force Base's mission relies heavily on air refueling operations, but who keeps those systems operational? Airman First Class Jared Vickers goes inside the plane to find out. The tools are out and the coveralls are on. It's time to get to work. The fuel system repair section at McConnell Air Force Base, Kansas, often find themselves in tight quarters where nobody can see or hear you. I wouldn't go in there if you're claustrophobic because it's dark, nobody can really hear you, so you bang on the side of the, or you knock so that people can hear you and you can communicate. This job is one of the dirtier duties, but also seen as one of the most essential to the mission. Without my job, the airplane really wouldn't fly. I mean, if you have a broken boost pump, the uh, engine can't get fuel. So we have to go in there and make sure it's fixed or the, engine, or the plane's not flying at all. Even if they did make it off the runway, the safety of the aircraft and crew would be at stake if all the systems weren't good to go. To me, it's really about uh, putting safe aircraft in the air uh, because not only do we worry about the flights and the crews that are on the 135s, but we also interact with all the different airframes that they refuel uh, throughout the course of their missions. Often unseen and unheard, their work speaks volumes on the dedication and commitment of the airmen working behind the scenes. Airman First Class Jared Vickers, McConnell Air Force Base, Kansas. After a successful deployment supporting flood relief efforts, members of the 219th Red Horse Squadron returned home to Montana in late October. Senior Master Sergeant Eric Peterson brings us the report. 
During the deployment, the Guardsmen were able to assist with rebuilding roads damaged by September flooding in the Lyons and Estes Park area of Colorado. The engineering specialists were also able to utilize a Guardsman's specialized civilian experience to build a retaining wall used to support a highway off-ramp. In this situation, we have an airman that uh, has a, uh, a business on the side um, where he actually does landscape design, landscape um, construction, and so he's building a retaining wall here um, uh, using that skill set. The project required the Guardsmen to stack boulders on top of one another in sort of a puzzle-like fashion. Heavy equipment operators using excavators had to gauge the size of each rock prior to placing them into the retaining wall. A flowable sealing material was then poured into the crevices between the rocks. I came down here and did a site visit and I knew right away that it was something that, that, that I could handle and that the 219th Red Horse could accomplish. In the flood damage location, the river had breached its banks and was running far from its normal channel. The flooding destroyed home foundations located near the original river. The guardsmen planned on returning the river to its original banks to allow homeowners to reclaim their property. They are confident that the Colorado residents appreciate the contribution that the 219th Red Horse Squadron members made to rebuilding flood damaged roads in their communities. We know that this could happen in our communities back home. We love to jump in, get our hands dirty and get the job done, help the people out that need to have it done. Maybe someday they'll come in and help my community out. It's, it's what Guard family is all about. The deployed leadership was satisfied that the members of the 219th Red Horse Squadron did their best in their effort to fix broken roads to help bring back a sense of normalcy to the residents of Colorado affected by the flooding. In Great Falls, Montana, this is Senior Master Sergeant Eric Peterson reporting for First Air Force Now. The Vermont Air National Guard recently received some great news for the future of the wing. Tech Sergeant Dan DePetrio brings us the story. The 158th Fighter Wing was selected as the first Air National Guard base for the F-35 fighter jets. The announcement came on December 3rd with the F-35s expected to arrive in the year 2020. This morning, I'm pleased to announce that the Secretary and the Chief of Staff of the Air Force have selected Burlington as the first Air National Guard base for the F-35. Congratulations! Cray was joined by Governor Peter Shumlin, Senator Patrick Leahy, Burlington Mayor Miro Weinberger, and Chairman of the South Burlington City Council, Pam McKenzie. Be proud of this day, be proud of this moment. Reporting for the Vermont Air National Guard, I'm Tech Sergeant Dan DiPietro. Where there's a tornado, where there's a forest fire, where Mother Nature is at her worst, where, where, there, where there's a surge, where there's a rescue, where there are Americans in need. We're there. When disaster strikes, we're one volunteer force. Helping each other. And simply doing what needs to be done. We, we are the Civil Air Patrol. The official auxiliary of the U.S. Air Force. To join, call 1-800-FLY-2338. Or log on to the World Wide Web at www.cap.gov. Who serves at the Montana Air National Guard? People just like you. People like Jackie Fogarty, daughter and part-time medical administrator. Ed McLean, prior service Marine Corps, Great Falls police officer and part-time security forces member. Brian Hagee, train engineer and part-time heavy equipment operator. Extraordinary people doing extraordinary jobs. Come join your neighbors, friends and families as members of the Montana Air National Guard. Call 800-874-7763 or find us on the web at mtairguard.com. Adjusting the radio, two seconds, a sip of soda, five and a half seconds, checking a text, six seconds. A few seconds of distraction can change a life. Stay alert, save a life.
A typical Wednesday morning at First Air Force quickly changed when simulated gunfire rang out at the Killy Center on Tyndall Air Force Base. Staff members practiced the run, hide, and fight response. Captain Jared Scott has the story. An active shooter scenario can happen at any time and anywhere. AF North and the 325th Security Forces Squadron teamed up to practice operational procedures during an active shooter exercise. Well, we're participating in the exercise for two reasons. The first is to validate the tactics, techniques, and procedures that our first responders are using. And then secondly, to ensure that the staff is trained in the run, hide, fight procedures. Uh, today the call came in, there was an active shooter at building 1210, the AF North building. Day's flight chief responded all patrols on the south side to the active shooter. Patrols made entrance in the south side of the building, cleared the first floor and entered the top floor. The active shooter was in a, con in a uh, conference room and he was uh, eliminated. Local medical, fire, 325th security forces, and AF North personnel all work together to improve response times in the event of a future incident. Well, I'm very confident that the exercise today was a success. We achieved all of our training objectives, which were basically to make sure that the uh, coordination between the 325th Fighter Wing and 1st Air Force uh, is there very tight and to make sure that the staff uh, was trained today in a very realistic, uh, no-notice active shooter exercise. It's the response of security forces, fire department, medical, and AF North. Uh, we, we eliminated a shooter within a minute and a half of entering the facility. Uh, we prevented any further casualties from taking place. The no-notice exercise was a complete success. Reporting for First Air Force Now, I'm Captain Jared Scott. Combat search and rescue missions are judged on their effectiveness to recover personnel, and the tools used in the mission are key to the safe return of service members. Senior Airman Cody Griffith tells us about a new vehicle used to aid in personnel recovery. The 28th and 88th Test and Evaluation Squadrons at Nellis Air Force Base will begin testing a new vehicle designed to complement the Guardian Angel weapon system and Air Force Rescue. This vehicle is a really interesting new acquisition program. First acquisition of an overland ground vehicle for the Air Force. It has the potential to fulfill an important capability gap for overland transportation of the Guardian Angel weapon system. A capability gap that may not be able to be fulfilled in all situations by rotorcraft or fixed wing aerial delivery craft. Well, ultimately, the success or failure of a combat search and rescue mission or a personnel recovery mission as a larger term is judged upon whether or not we can return a live survivor or isolated person to friendly control and get them back to duty. Potentially this vehicle offers a chance for us to extend the reach of our combat search and rescue forces, allowing them to reach further and faster uh, into the battle space so that they can provide uh, force protection, technical rescue to the survivor earlier on uh, in the mission scenario. The Guardian Angel Air Deployable Recovery Vehicle, also known as the GARV, will be put through a series of tests and evaluations to determine the vehicle's effectiveness in the battle space. The tests are scheduled to last through fiscal year 14 and will be a key factor in the acquisition program. Senior Airman Cody Griffith, Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada. Montana Air National Guard senior and non-commissioned officers were inducted into the respective rank tier at the 120th Fido Wing during the November Unit Training Assembly. Senior Master Sergeant Eric Peterson reports. The NCO induction ceremony recognizes two of the major career milestones reached by members of the enlisted ranks. When a United States Air Force enlisted member is promoted to Staff Sergeant, they enter the NCO Corps. Being promoted to Master Sergeant and becoming a senior NCO means even more sacrifice and responsibility. NCO and senior NCO induction ceremonies have been held for many years at the 120th Fighter Wing and reflect the importance senior leadership places in the promotion process. The new rank brings with it additional authority and responsibility to the promoted NCO. Well, these ceremonies uh, are deep-rooted in tradition. We have this tradition so that these individuals and um, are aware of the significance of the tier that they're moving into. It's not just another rank, it's a significant increase in responsibilities. 120th Communications Flight Staff Sergeant Holly Hefley was inducted into the NCO ranks during the ceremony and had good advice for younger airmen as they progress through their enlisted career. She encourages them to look to their wingmen for assistance when help is needed. Put in the hard work, ask for help if you need it. There's always somebody out there that's going to help you in anything that you need, whether it be work, you know, your fit test, or even airman leadership school. That's been quite tough for some people, so 
Just ask for help. You'll get there eventually. <laughs> Organizers were happy to see such a large turnout of unit members come to support the honored NCOs. It's super important for WING members to come and uh, participate and um, show their encouragement to our new staff sergeants and senior NCOs. It's uh, very important. It's very special. And today we had a huge turnout, and it's good to see that. NCO and senior NCO induction ceremonies follow the promotion cycles at the 120th Fighter Wing and are scheduled to be held every six months. In Great Falls, Montana, this is Senior Master Sergeant Eric Peterson reporting for First Air Force Now. Members of the Canadian Search and Disaster Dogs Association recently took part in Operation Damian. Corporal Tyler Mitchell reports. The U.S. and the Republic of the Philippines have been long-standing partners and allies. And as part of Operation Damayan, several nations have come together to help the Republic of the Philippines. But there's an even older partner and ally out here, man's best friend. We have cadaver dogs and we have uh, dogs that do live only. This particular dog does cadaver searches as well as live, but uh, he's doing a lot of cadaver searches now. We've been, in the recent year, we've been to Peru, to Turkey, uh, to Italy, to Haiti. And now here, it usually is a very long recovery, judging by other uh, countries such as Peru, for example, that's still dealing with it. So I think that the country will still need help and support from other countries. Unique capabilities such as search and rescue teams are able to get to Tacloban Air Base using the air bridge between Villamore and Tacloban. Reporting from Villamore Air Base, I'm Marine Corporal Tyler Mitchell. Sometimes a simple shooting range isn't enough to train elite soldiers. Amherst First Class Stephen Ellis tells us about a better solution for Special Operations members. Drive out to the heart of the Eglin Range on any given day and you'll find the guys from Have Ace. Have Ace doesn't stand for anything, but is a code name for a unit that brings together operators of every branch. We train everyone within the Army, Navy, and Marine Special Operations Command, specifically Green Berets, Navy SEAL, and MARSOC operators. Units come from all over the globe to train with HAVACE, who provide an Air Force link as well as organization of each team's training needs. The biggest advantage here on Eglin and Hurlburt is the fact we have all the special operations platforms here at one location so the team can come and, and put together full mission profiles utilizing multiple assets at one time. And also the range complex allows teams to uh, do live fire training with every weapon system that uh, a special operations team would have their hands on, all at the same time. On top of the machine guns, grenade launchers, and anti-tank rockets, Hurlburt's gunships are overhead, providing air-to-ground support. The big thing is we just give these guys experience and exposure to all the different special operations aircraft that the Air Force has to offer. Each team's training lasts two weeks. The 140 flying missions per year that HAVACE is responsible for familiarizes operators with working alongside AVSOC assets. Reporting from the Eglin Range, I'm Airman First Class, Stephen Ellis. Adjusting the radio. Two seconds. A sip of soda. Five and a half seconds. Checking a text. Six seconds. A few seconds of distraction can change a life. Stay alert. Save a life. Forest fire. Where Mother Nature is at her worst. Where there, where there is a surge. Where there is a rescue. Where there are Americans in need. Where there. there.
disaster strikes. We're one volunteer force. Helping each other and simply doing what needs to be done. We, we are the Civil Air Patrol. The official auxiliary of the U.S. Air Force. To join, call 1-800-FLY-2338. Or log on to the World Wide Web at www.cap.gov. Who serves at the Montana Air National Guard? People just like you. People like Jackie Fogarty, daughter and part-time medical administrator. Ed McLean, prior service Marine Corps, Great Falls police officer and part-time security forces member. Brian Hagee, train engineer and part-time heavy equipment operator. Extraordinary people doing extraordinary jobs. Come join your neighbors, friends and families as members of the Montana Air National Guard. Call 800-874-7763 or find us on the web at mtairguard.com. Mississippi recently hosted the Air National Guard's premier Southern training event, Southern Strike 14. Tech Sergeant Ed Staten tells us about the joint training exercise held in Gulfport, Mississippi. The area right around Gulfport is a small pro-Western country uh, that has a large natural gas deposit. Uh, it's surrounded on the east and west and north by aggressor nations that have tried to take over uh, that country. They've asked for U.S. assistance. We've sent a joint task force and that sets the stage for the war. Although the recent invasion of South Mississippi by enemy forces was not a reality, the joint U.S. forces' response to enemy aggression in the Southern Strike 14 exercise incorporated many realistic training components. The exercise's objective was to provide tailored, cost-effective, and realistic combat training for National Guard and active duty forces in a multinational environment. Southern Strike 14 focused on tactical level joint training exercises that emphasized close air support, aeromedical evacuations, combat search and rescue, and suppression and destruction of enemy air defenses in a counterinsurgency scenario. These missions that included components from the Air Force, Army, Navy, and Marines were held at the Gulfport, Mississippi CRTC and at Camp Shelby, located just 50 miles north. We have to execute these same tactics out in the real world, and uh, we can't do that without the, the ranges and the airspace and the facilities that have all been provided. And uh, again, getting our, our sailors down here to, uh, to perfect their trade with, with these great facilities is, uh, is a tremendous opportunity for us. The success of Southern Strike 14 has organizers planning on international involvement for the next exercise as joint forces will once again converge on South Mississippi and its attractive training areas. Gulfport has not only uh, great facilities here on the base, but we have a huge air-to-air -air exercise area over the Gulf of Mexico. And we also have access to the Camp Shelby air-to-ground ranges where, where we can practice assault strip landings drop uh, airdrop. We can drop live weapons. Uh, last night we had F-16s, AC-130s, uh, F-18s all involved in, uh, in exercises at Camp Shelby. Reporting for the Mississippi Air National Guard, I'm Tech Sergeant Ed Staten. Special Operations Command Airmen recently awarded their commander with one of the highest awards given from the enlisted to an officer. Airman First Class Nicholas Ketz brings us the story. On a routine flight back from Maxwell Air Force Base, Lieutenant General Eric File, the AFSOC commander, received a surprise he soon won't forget. Sir, whether we're talking about taking care of our wounded or we're talking about resiliency or fitness or, or how we take care of our families, you're always there thinking about the lowest ranking airmen all the way up to the chief, up to our, uh, our senior leaders, and we're very appreciative of that. And uh, if you would allow us, we'd like to invite you to be inducted into the AFSOC Order of the Sword. The Order of the Sword is the highest honor the enlisted can give to an officer. You know, but everything we do, and we try to do, is for you guys, because you guys do the mission. You know, you guys have the highest op, op tempo in the United States Air Force, and you never say no. You just keep going and going and going, and how can you do that for 12 years with an all-volunteer force? It's absolutely amazing. General File will become the 9th AFSOC Order of the Sword inductee on April 18, 2014. Reporting from Hurlburt Field, I'm Airman First Class, Nicholas Ketz. Check 6 started as a program to provide airmen with skills to defend their base at home or deployed. Staff Sergeant Dustin Roberts shows how security forces are training military members in self-defense. Check 6 is an old military phrase meaning, watch your back. From that saying, a program was developed to help combat complacency against insider threats. 379th Air Expeditionary Wing facilitators offer a combatives course to enhance base defense, ensuring airmen have the skills to watch their backs as well as those around them. 
The Check 6 program is important because it teaches life-saving tactics to base populace that is very easy to do, that breaks it down to a level that everybody can understand to, to hopefully survive a lethal encounter. The goal of the course is for members to take these skills and be confident in their usage, no matter what stressful or dangerous situation is thrown their way. All around the world, every week if you watch the news, active shooter incidents are occurring. So we're hoping people will take these skills, go back to your home station, out in the real world, on, off base, it doesn't matter where you're at. The Check 6 um, tactics that we teach will help save lives. Contact your local Check 6 office for more information on the training and how you can do your part in staying vigilant. Reporting from Southwest Asia, I'm Air Force Staff Sergeant Dustin Roberts. The 120th Fighter Wing held an enlisted continuing process improvement event during the November Unit Training Assembly. Senior Master Sergeant Eric Peterson reports. The event was open to all enlisted members of the 120th Fighter Wing and 219th Red Horse Squadron and was designed to solicit ideas from the airmen that could lead to process improvements in the Montana Air National Guard. Program organizers had identified problems in Air Force training and retention and recognition programs that the group could address. We took some topics that we feel we need to maybe look at and could improve on for the betterment of our enlisted personnel. And it was an opportunity for us to get together, kind of brainstorm and come up with some solutions that we can present to leadership. At the end of the event, suggestions for improvement were compiled by the facilitators. Yeah. The results were then briefed to senior leadership during an officer's call held near the end of the day. The airmen that participated in the event were pleased that senior leaders were sincerely interested in hearing their process improvement ideas. Um, I think we did a really good job working on our solutions and that was actually the good part about having such a big group of people with a lot of different experiences and ranks because people that have worked in the civilian world for 20, 30 years brought different experiences than I do as a young airman. The event organizers would like to see the enlisted feedback provided to senior leadership continue. We would love to do something again in the future. We know there's always going to be issues. There's so much change going on all the time. It's a lot easier to put our heads together um, and try and come up with solutions as, as a team and, and make some change than it is just on an individual basis. So I see this maybe being something, hopefully, that we will do down the road. In Great Falls, Montana, this is Senior Master Sergeant Eric Peterson reporting for First Air Force Now. The holidays can be a difficult time, especially for military families who have lost a loved one. For some families, Reeds Across America provides a way to honor those fallen. Sergeant Allison Pelletier reports. Holidays are a time to be spent with family, but for some, this is impossible. They finally came and gave us the news and it's like the worst day in your life and your your mind can't wrap around that your son is gone. Meet Dolly and Jim Sullivan. We lost our son uh, Captain Christopher Sullivan January 18th 2005 Baghdad Iraq. The loss of their son devastated them but with the help of Wreaths Across America, they found a way to honor him. We vaguely knew about it uh, before this, you know, and uh, we started going after our son was buried in Arlington. 2007, we had gone to Arlington, you know, to help lay the wreaths, and we, we saw all the uh, outpour of uh, emotions and support. Wreaths Across America is a week-long event in December starting in Harrington, Maine, and ending in Arlington National Cemetery, where Captain Christopher Sullivan is entombed. It's good that we actually get to visit him here and be with all the people and other people that we've met, and we get to re reunionize with them when we get here every year, so. The Sullivans will continue their support for wreaths across America and hope someday all veterans will be honored as they honor their son. Well, I don't want them to just think he was just a name. So if I put the picture on his wreath and they see his picture, they know he was a person. Yeah. We do that every year, yep. put his picture there. So he, he, he eternally 29 years old. Reporting for the 121st Public Affairs Detachment, I'm Sergeant Allison Pelletier. I'm Master Sergeant Jerry Harlan, and that wraps up another edition of First Air Force Now. To help us tell your story, contact the First Air Force News Director. And to all the men and women who are making sacrifices at home and abroad, thanks. We'll see you again soon for another edition of First Air Force Now.